Good morning, everyone. Good morning and happy Easter. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. It's great to welcome you here this morning on this Easter Sunday. We've got a really special service planned today, and we're going to start by singing two songs you'll see listed there in the bulletin. My name is uh, David Donovan, and it's my joy and privilege to welcome you to worship on this Easter Sunday. Let's stand and sing this first song, number 261 in the hymnal. This is Lord of the Dance, set to the shaker tune that we all know and recognize so very well in this state. Here we go. <laughs> One, two, three. Let's sing together. Ready? I danced in the morning when the world was begun, and I danced in the moon and the stars and the sun, and I came down from heaven and I danced on the earth. At Bethlehem I had my birth. Dance then wherever you may be. I am the Lord of the dance, said he, and I'll be all wherever you may be and I'll lead you all in the dance said he I danced for the scribe and the Pharisee but they would not dance and they would not follow me I danced for the fishermen for James and John they came to me and the dance went on dance then wherever you Lord of the dance, said he, and I'll lead you all wherever you may be, and I'll lead you all in the dance, said he. I danced on the Sabbath when I cured the lame. The holy people said it was a shame. They whipped and they stripped and they hung me high, and they left me there on a cross to die. Dance then wherever you may be. I am the Lord of the dance, said he, and I'll lead you all wherever you may be, and I'll lead you all in the dance, said he. I danced on a Friday when the sky turned black. It's hard to dance with the devil on your back. They buried my body and they thought I I am the dance and I still go on. Dance then wherever you may be. I am the Lord of the dance, said he, and I'll lead you all wherever you may be, and I'll lead you all in the dance, said he. They cut me down and I left up high. I am the life that will never, never die. I'll live in you if you live in me. I am the Lord of the dance, said he. Dance then wherever you may be. I am the Lord of the dance, said he. And I'll lead you all wherever you may be. And I'll lead you all in the dance, said he. And our second song this morning by... Keith Getty and Stuart Townend. This is In Christ Alone, number 3105 in worship and song, if you want to use the music. Two and three. And... alone my hope is found he is my light my strength my song this cornerstone this solid ground firm through the fiercest drought and storm 
What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are stilled, when striving cease, my comforter. Let's gather our hearts together for a moment of prayer. Loving and gracious God, it is a beautiful morning, a morning where we have gathered to celebrate once again the resurrection of your son, Jesus Christ. We remember that day that happened so, so many years ago, but we also celebrate it today in each of our lives. We thank you for blessing us with your presence, and we thank you for giving us that gift of eternal life. So as we continue on this morning, this Easter morning, help us to feel your presence in our hearts and in our minds. So when we leave this place, we are ready to proclaim to the world, just like the women did at the tomb, that you are risen. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now if you would, turn to those around you and welcome them to worship this morning.
Happy Easter, everybody. Good to be here. All right, I'll talk a little louder, David. I saw you back there. <coughs> it's always good to be in God's house, but today especially, because today is a day when we celebrate the fact that the tomb is empty and that life is ours to be had because of what Christ has done for us. And so I'm so glad that you've chosen to join with us in worship today through the Centrum, those of you that are joining us online this morning. Uh, we don't quite do sunrise here, but this is our early one, right? It's good to see everybody out. I wanted to share just a brief couple of announcements. Uh, you know, there won't be a lot happening here probably, uh, you know, on Monday because uh, folks will be catching their breath from the high holy seasons that we've been going through. You'll see lots of upcoming events uh, that will be occurring in our, uh, and fading in and out. We're having a little trouble with this new system. Uh, again, uh, there's an Opus Corral concert next weekend. Uh, those of you that have been with us know that uh, one of our beloved, uh, Bill, passed away. Uh, you know, yesterday, and again, watch for more information regarding his service, which will be coming up uh, later in the week. Uh, we're excited about David's group, the Opus Corral. We're going to be here next weekend uh, sharing their gift of music. We also have a family night at the ballpark. Uh, next Sunday, though, uh, we do our part in our celebration of mission event. And as I have shared with you, I know Randy shared a few weeks ago, our pastor emeritus, uh, Barry Mall is a fellow pastor that passed away recently. Barry's the one that started the celebration of mission event in our annual conference. And so I'm so excited to be celebrating that mission event, partly just because it's a wonderful program to raise money for our mission projects throughout the state, but also to celebrate Barry's gift to us in starting that program here in our annual conference. So next week, uh, we'll have a guest preacher coming uh, to be with us, Dr. Michael Linger from the House of the Carpenter in Wheeling. It's one of our mission projects, and he'll be here to share with us the word and also share about his mission project. Uh, we also know that today is Easter, but it's also another special day that doesn't quite get quite the hoopla of uh, Easter, but it should. It's David Donathan's birthday today. <laughs> so I wanted us to sing happy birthday to David. you will join with me. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear David. Happy birthday to you. Amen. And now that we've publicly embarrassed David, let us all celebrate together. Uh, we thank you, David, for all you do, as always. As we gather today to celebrate the power of God in our lives through the resurrection, we always, as a, a community of people, come together in prayer to pray for those things that are in our hearts and minds, such as the family I mentioned a moment ago who's lost their loved ones. I received a call this morning. There's another member of our congregation that's probably starting on that journey as well. And so we have many that are going through a valley of sorrow on this day when we celebrate the promise of resurrection. Also, I've noticed the, the prayer concerns that those of you have written as you've come into the centrum. And if you're joining us online, we invite you to share your prayer concerns uh, through the chat feature on Facebook so we can join them with all of our prayer concerns as we pray for one another in the midst of these days where it may seem dark, but we know that that light is shining because of that empty tomb. As I lay these prayer requests on the pulpit, I'll light our prayer candle, and then we can go to the Lord together in prayer. And while we do this, we're going to sing number 2108, Oh, How He Loves You and Me.
oh God of love and grace. Oh, how you love us. Loving us so much, you made that journey to the cross for us. And more importantly, even after that, you broke forth with new life on this day, this Easter day, the day we remember that your love has conquered all, conquered even the mystery of death. And so as we gather as your people today, we celebrate that love. Your love for us, your love in your son Jesus who, who lives now among us in a way that we can hardly fathom. For indeed the chains of hell and death could not hold him as he bursts forth to show us that you are victorious in all things. And today, oh God, we gather as your people to celebrate that victory the victory that says death is not the last word, the, the victory that shows us that as hard as life can be, we can overcome it through your love. And so, oh God, we give you thanks for that today. We pray that you would help us be a, a faithful people, those who, like those women long ago, though in fear and at first silenced, go out to proclaim that good news of your love proclaiming that love and power so that all might know it and hear it. Help us to be proclaimers. We know there are those in our community who this day seems dark over loss and sorrow, but may they know that light and that power of resurrection today and know that they are loved by you. And it is a love that cannot end and a love that cannot be shattered. We pray that your love and resurrection power would break forth in our world today anew, O God, so that all might turn to you in these things that weigh us down, like sin and death and war and hatred. All those things might be eliminated in your love. Bring forth that power upon us, we pray. And we ask these things today as we share the prayer that our risen Savior invited us to say, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I'd like to invite all the children to come up front, please. Let me get out of your way. Come on up. Don't be afraid. Everybody looks so nice this morning. That's my favorite thing about Easter. Everybody dresses up anywhere you want. So did you guys get baskets full of goodies this morning? Yeah. So probably the last thing you all need is some more goodies, right, mom and dad? Um, but I have a treat for you guys because um, anybody know what these are? They're M&Ms. Um, but they're super special M&Ms. Do you know why? They're the Easter M&Ms, and I have an Easter pro, uh, poem to tell us why the Easter M&Ms are so special. It says, these candies tell a story, the best news you'll ever hear. It's about Jesus dying on the cross so that we could be brought near. Hold them up and turn them, and you will see the M will become a W, an E and a three. So the E stands for Easter and God's everlasting love and his eternal plan. It reminds us of the cross and the way God rescued sinful man. The three represents three days Jesus spent in the grave by his death his children he did save. The M 
reminds us of mercy of the Messiah showed as he died in our place and the miracle of his resurrection so we can see him face to face. The W reminds us that, we, that he alone is worthy of our worship and our praise. And he calls us to be witnesses around the world for days. Happy Easter, guys. Here, everyone, take a treat. Thank you, Ashley, and everyone enjoy their M&Ms and what they mean for us on this special day. Now, as we gather, we also come together to share in our tithes and our offering. We share these gifts so that they might go to help proclaim this good news of resurrection to our community and the world. Your generosity in giving those gifts enable us to do all the programming we do here at our church, including our programming for children and youth and all ages. And as your pastor, I am always so thankful for your generosity. Through your generosity, we've been able to do great things at Christ Church and will continue to be able to do so. So now as we share in our tithes and our offerings, David has a special tune for us. And so I'll need to get back with the band. I'll let him share about the song. This particular piece is by the contemporary Christian artist Chris Tomlin and others, including Matt Mayer, who was another big name. This is a piece entitled I Will Rise, a very personal uh, witness to the glory and majesty of today.
Thank you, David, for that beautiful song. <clears throat> and the rest of the band, too. Our lesson for this Easter Sunday, we have two. The first one comes to us from Corinthians. Uh, it's the 15th chapter, uh, verses 1 to 11. Paul's writing to his friends at that church in Corinth, a church that was not unlike us, filled with a mixed bag of folks, uh, but one in which he shares these words. He says, now I would remind you, brothers and sisters, of the good news that I proclaim to you, which you in turn receive, in which also you stand, through which also you are being saved, if you hold firmly to the message that I proclaim to you, unless you have come to believe in vain. For I handed on to you as of first importance what I in turn had received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers and sisters at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have died. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unfit to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me has not been in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we proclaim, and so you have come to believe. This is the word of the Lord. And then our gospel lesson comes to us from the gospel of Mark, the 16th chapter. We don't always get real formal in this service, but it's Easter, so I invite you to stand for our gospel lesson today. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Salome, brought spices so that they might go the first day of the week. When the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. They had been saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? When they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled back. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, do not be alarmed. You're, you are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has been raised. He is not here. Look, there is the place they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he's gone ahead of you to Galilee. And there you will see him, just as he told you. So they went out and fled from the tomb, for terror and amazement had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. This is the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. You may be seated. Let us pray. Loving and gracious God, as we gather on this glorious Easter morning, I, I pray as always that the simple words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts, that these things would be acceptable in your sight. For you indeed are our rock and our redeemer, our resurrected Lord. Amen. You know, they often say there are two kinds of people in this world. There are full people and there are empty people. That We sometimes call them pessimists or optimists. Kind of that cup half full folks and the cup half empty folks. But if one were to take a poll and a question, which, which would you rather be, full or empty? Well, most of us would say full, right? Because, well, full is good, right? And as a people living in the most fruitful and economically blessed nation on earth, most of us, when we look at our lives, we, we see that we're, we're full. And we feel pretty complete. But what about a full cemetery? You know, in March 2008, the mayor of a village named Sarpor Inx, I'm not real good in my French, but it's in southwest France, he threatened the residents with punishment if they would die. And he did so because the town cemetery was full and there was no place left to bury them. And so Mayor Gerald Lalane arranged for the governing council to pass an ordinance that read in part... 
All persons not having applied in the cemetery and wishing to be buried in Saperno are forbidden from dying in the parish. Offenders will be severely punished. Now, I'm not sure how he was going to punish them, you know, to be honest. But the thing is, I was thinking about this because the dilemma that the folks face today and the day that we celebrated that first Easter was actually just the opposite. You see, the tomb wasn't full, it was empty. And that was the problem. And so when they were confronted with this mystery of Easter, they were confronted with this mystery of the empty tomb, they came up short, as sometimes we do. And we do because we feel incomplete because this mystery is just too big. It's bigger than we can understand. And that was the reaction of those women as we hear in the Gospel of Mark, as Mark remembers and retells the story. Now, most scholars will note that in the original and the, and the oldest copies that we have of Mark's Gospel, it stops right where I did. The other verses you read in that Scripture, where they'll say shorter version or longer versions. They're, they're referred to as later editions. And no matter how we might feel about critical analysis of Scripture, the fact is, verse 8 doesn't make much sense to us. Particularly because we have the other Gospels. In their versions, we have Mary seeing Jesus in the garden, and he, she thinks he's a gardener. And the disciples fall and they worship at Jesus' feet in the Gospel of Matthew. And then in Luke, we have Peter running to the tomb in amazement at the story that the women share to him. Those are the ways we, we remember the resurrection. And it's good that we do that. They, they seem full. They're complete. But Mark... Mark simply says, they fled for terror and an amazement had seized them, and they said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. They said nothing? Nothing to anyone? Why would these women not tell anyone? We know they are faithful disciples. They had made their way to the tomb under that darkness of dawning day to anoint their master. They are doing what any disciple would do for their master who was deceased. They come with the oils, the bombs, and the spices for their body. They're wondering who will get them into where their body lies. They know that the stone in front of the tomb would be too big for them to move. Of course, I believe that the stone of grace that was on the, gra grief that was on their heart was even bigger for that. That was their main problem was their grief. I mean, they had watched Jesus die a, a horrifying death. And the men, that inner circle that had been with Jesus all these years, they had all run away and were in hiding. Yet these women come anyway. And when they get there, they encounter this mysterious and miraculous scene. For they need worry not that that stone had been rolled away. Hey, and as it was rolled away, it exposed an empty slab where they had laid Jesus' body. And now there was a man sitting on it, an angel of the Lord. And he tells them, don't be scared. You, you have come looking for Jesus. He is risen. Tell Peter and the others he's going on ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him. It's exactly like what he said. And then they fled in terror and didn't say anything. Now imagine there are some ways we can really identify with these women. For the reaction these women showed at the tomb is often our reaction when we are faced with this mystery of death. Our most common reaction is silence. We can't say anything. We don't know what to say. It seems impossible to come up with the right words when someone dies, so, so we tend to say nothing. And I think these women were the same. When they got to the tomb, they were stunned into silence. And in the end, they, of course, they, 
couldn't not say anything. For we know they said something. For we know they shared what they discovered in that, that dawn's early light. We know they did what the angel instructed. We know they said something or we wouldn't be here today. So the question I've been wrestling with this year is why would Mark end the gospel like he did? Telling us that they didn't say anything. Why would he leave that, that ending empty? And I believe that Mark, in these earliest renderings of the good news of Jesus Christ, he wanted his hearers to remember something that was very, very important. I believe he wanted them to remember that the story of Christ, this wondrous resurrection narrative, this ultimate defeat of death through the power of God is something that's unfinished. It's incomplete. It was incomplete, of course, if we leave it just as a story in the past. If all we do is read this passage and simply say, oh, that's nice. 2,000 years ago, Jesus died and rose on the third day. Some women saw him and his disciples. It's a great story. Just as those first hearers knew that those women were not silent, Mark is reminding us today that we must not be silent either. For you see, the, the work and the power of the resurrection is unfinished unless we write the ending. It's empty unless we become part of the story. And the truth is, all of us are part of that story. God's redemptive purposes here in the world will prevail in us as we proclaim that good news and embrace its purpose and work to its fulfillment. Mark knew that. And so as he retold this tale, this most wonderful story of how Jesus rose from the grave, he wanted us to remember that no matter how startling this news seems to be, no matter how far-fetched it seems to be, no matter how stunned we may feel, the fact is it's true. And this tomb is empty. And like those women, we must tell the world about it. Telling people everywhere that God has defeated death. Once and for all. That God has destroyed evil's stronghold on our lives. That the, the gates of hell have literally been rent asunder because our Lord lives. As James White, the pastor of St. Giles Presbyterian Church in North Carolina, told his congregation one Easter. He says, it's not at the grave that the gospel writers encouraged readers to find the resurrected Lord. For you see, in every account, Jesus found his disciples in places other than the grave. Mark is just more straightforward and honest about it. There is no resurrection appearance at the tomb. It's just empty. And the followers are told to go find Jesus in Galilee. But where is Galilee? We well, see, my friends, Galilee was their home. That's where they lived. It's the place that they lived and they worked. So Mark is reminding them and telling them that the Lord isn't living in this tomb. Jesus is out there waiting for us. He's out there waiting to meet us in the places where we live and work. Because you see, this resurrection story isn't just some neat story from 2,000 years ago. The empty tomb tells us that our Lord has gone on ahead of us. And he meets us right here in Charleston, West Virginia. He meets us where we live and breathe. At this moment, he's there with all of those nurses and doctors right over there at CAMC. He's there. And he's there with those tellers and office workers that will be trudging into work tomorrow in the banks and the buildings downtown. Because that tomb is empty, Jesus shows up. He shows up at McDonald's. He shows up at Fife Street. He, he shows up at Soho's. He's, he's risen now so he can go to Edgewood Summit. He can go to Charleston Gardens. And he shows up over there at Sojourners and, and Covenant House and Manamia. You see, Jesus has left the tomb. It's empty. 
He's gone to Galilee, the places where we are, the places in which we live. See, the tomb is empty. And in its emptiness, we find the fulfillment of all of God's promises. The Christian faith simply claims that while we may die physically, our hope in such times is not simply the power of the human soul to survive death, but in the power of God to give life where there is death. You hear that? Our hope in such times is not simply in the power of the human soul to survive death, but in the power of God to give life where there is death. You see, the promise of the resurrection is that death cannot win. The tomb is empty, and because it is empty, death has no power over us anymore. And the power of the empty tomb is about experiencing and and releasing that power of resurrection life in the midst of all of our difficulties and all of our darknesses. We see the struggle and the heartache of addictions and illness. Because the tomb is empty, we know God can rehabilitate and renew and rejuvenate and heal. And when we, where we see poverty and anguish because the tomb is empty, we know that God can change comfort and convert it. Where there is sadness and sorrow, we know there can be life and hope. And where there is loss, we know there can be renewal. And where there is death, we know there is eternal life. It is a promise which is stunning in its mystery But it is one which compels us to to speak, to shout, and to exclaim and proclaim good news for all the world to hear. You see, because of their loving perseverance and courage, these women that went to this tomb are the ones who were rewarded with the honor and entrusted with the most important news that the world could ever hear. And these women and, and many after them can be rightly called history's midwives of hope. And so they become for us, I think, on this resurrection morning of Easter, an example in the story of what we too are called to be. We are called to be those midwives of hope. And what does it mean to be a midwife of hope? You know, the word hope is bannered around in so many different ways, both mystical and rhetorical and religious Sometimes its meaning escapes the world and it seems to escape the reality from which we live. Hope simply becomes a feeling or a mood or or an inspired moment that's lived somehow above the painful and dull agonies of history. We're down here in in the midst of it all and someone says, well, you have to have hope. And right away we say, well, am I supposed to be feeling something I'm not feeling? To get into a mood that just isn't really natural to me. I need to rise above the the daily reality somehow and be hopeful. When I read those words from Jim Wallace, I, I began wrestling with this word hope. And more and more I am convinced that we must see hope in a different and I would say a more biblical way. For you see, hope is not simply a feeling. It's not a mood or or a rhetorical flourish. It's a choice. And it's a decision. And it's an action based upon faith. Hope is the very dynamic of history. Hope is the engine of change. Hope is the energy of transformation. For you see, hope is a door from one reality into another. And for we Christians, the resurrection is that door. It's the door of hope. For Jesus shows us that resurrection comes by way of the cross. Suffering and hope are always joined together. And sometimes there's a cost for moving from one reality to the other in our personal lives and history. But we have to walk through that door. That door of hope. And that empty tomb is our door of hope today. For you see, the tomb of Jesus is empty. It will always be empty. It's not going to change. It doesn't matter what people are looking for and trying to disprove this mystery. 
Because where we see the evidence of this resurrection is not in just the rocks of a tomb. It's in the people who are changed by its power. Like those early apostles, even those women who at first were terrified but then told the story. To those apostles who when they heard it, this bunch of scallywags, as anyone you can name, they they began to heave against that immovable wall of the Roman Empire and eventually watched it collapse in a heap in the face of this news of Christ. Could they have done so if the resurrection was just an idle tale? How could these 12 common people and their others do that? Risk life and limb going to the point of being hung upside down on a cross, or Paul preaching until he laid down his head on the executioner's block. My sisters and brothers, they did that because the tomb is empty. And in its emptiness, they found the power to change the world. So as Mark tells us in those original manuscripts, this Easter story is incomplete. It is finished because it is an ongoing reality. And we all of that. So I invite you today to receive that good news, to allow it to inspire and fill you even in the face of death and loss or whatever you're dealing with, and to go forth from this place today to share that good news with others whom you meet. For that, that power of the empty tomb is the power to literally change the world. And it starts with us. So allow it to change you so that you can go proclaim that Christ the Lord is risen, and he is risen indeed. Thanks be to God. Amen. As we bring our service to a close, I'd like to invite you to stand and turn in the hymnal to number 364, Because He Lives.
That better? All right. Now, my sisters and brothers, let us go forth into the world, not as a, a group of silent people, but those who have encountered this mystery of the resurrection, and let us go forth and proclaim that good news to the world so that all may know its power and its strength. Let us go in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.